Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Energy Made Easy webinar. My name is Aileen DC, manager on the Enterprise Supports team, and we are delighted to see so many of you taking the time today to join this webinar, which is part of our new suite of climate action support. So onto our agenda of the day then, we are acutely aware of the challenges that you have been facing with the rising cost of energy and the impact that all of this is having on the bottom line of your businesses. So while this is such a vast area, uh, you know, we simply can't get to everything today, but we will have other webinars to cover more topics. Um, so if we don't get there today, we certainly will in the future. So on to our agenda of today then, to help you navigate this energy landscape, our agenda really is, is specifically focusing on essentials for energy management, programs available from SCAI, and then we'll move on to loan and finance options available from SBCI. So just to kick, kick off then, we are delighted to be joined by our expert panel. So I would like to introduce our MC for the day, Tina O'Dwyer. Tina is founder and MD of the Tourism Space. And Tina is a professional trainer, facilitator and coach, and is an expert in sustainable and responsible tourism. So for over a decade now, Tina has been supporting businesses and policymakers to develop practical, sustainable approaches to tourism. So Tina will introduce our panel as we meet them. So I'll pass it over to you, Tina. Thanks, Aileen. Good morning, everybody. Um, great to, to have so many with us. Well, as we know, energy is one of the highest cost areas in your business, business and also one of the highest, um, I suppose, accountants for carbon emissions and making it an absolute priority right now. As Aileen said, we have three topics to cover. We have experts, one of whom is going to talk about where to start and what to do, one who's going to talk about practical supports to help you do that, and the third is going to talk about some finance options. As Aileen said, please share your questions. We have participants on today from all around the country. If we don't get to them all, and we probably won't get to them all, we'll get to as many as we can, they'll still be a great barometer of what kind of questions are out there, and they'll help inform future supports. So we'll get straight to it. I'd like to introduce our first expert, um, which is who is James Hogan. And James is with the Clean Technology Centre based at Munster Technological University. He's an environmental consultant, energy auditor and carbon assessor. And James has extensive hands-on experience of working with businesses to achieve significant cost savings and carbon savings through energy management and other things. He has worked with the Green Business Programme, the Green Hospitality Programme, as well as internationally on EU and other projects. So I'm going to hand straight over to you, James. I believe you're going to start with the, the most fundamental questions, which are why be uh, concerned about energy management and how to go about it. Over to you, James. Thank you, Tina, and good morning, everybody. OK, so my, my discussion will be on the essentials of energy management. And, you know, there's, there's a lot you can do with energy management. Um, simple things that can be done that uh, cost nothing. So they're the no cost and low cost actions. And I'll, I'll discuss some of those this morning. Um, OK, so as Tina and um, has also has al already mentioned, you know, um, the cost of energy has increased dramatically over the last number of months. Um, due to many different factors, including the war in Ukraine. But even before that, um, prices were increasing. Uh, and this is down to the fact that, you know, energy is, a, uh, particularly oil and gas, are a limited resource, and um, they are likely to increase regardless of whether there's war or not. Um, also, we have the factor that there are going to be additional carbon taxes added to these energies into the future. Uh, so we can expect energy, uh, particularly gas and oil and, and fossil fuel type energies to increase in the future, which do affect the price of electricity, which is generated from these uh, fossil fuels. Fortunately, in Ireland, we have a high percentage of wind, so that might be able to mitigate some of the, the cost of energy into the future. Um, the government does have a climate action plan, and they will be requiring businesses like yourselves to reduce your carbon emissions by 50% by 2030 and to be net zero by 2050. Now, that's that's an extremely difficult target to meet, but uh, an essential if we are to combat climate change. And I have three photographs here in the slide. Um, each of them is representing some climate actions that have, have happened in Ireland in the last number of years. So if you catch your mind back a couple of years to 2018, we had the Ophelia 
uh, we had the beast from the east, which was the when we were snowed in for a couple of weeks, and then we had extreme temperatures in 2018 with water shortages. So climate change is happening, and we need to tackle that, and that's why there are going to be um, requirements to reduce our carbon. Um, just quickly on, on to the price of energy. Um, this slide shows the increases in energy over the last two years. Uh, for example, electricity has gone up to over 25 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, and it also shows you know, other fuels that are gas, LPG, oil. And you will notice that different energies cost different prices. So when you are choosing uh, an energy to run your business, electricity is the most expensive form of energy. Whereas natural gas, you can see it's there, it's up around, it was, it's over five cent now per, per kilowatt hour, or even more, I would imagine, at this stage. But yet, it would be a cheaper energy to use than electricity. However, we are being pushed by the government to move towards electricity because we need to move away from fossil fuels. So there is a bit of a conundrum there. Okay, so how do we manage energy? I, you know, I suppose one of the first things we need to do is actually identify um, how much energy we're using in our business and to pull the data together to form to make to form a picture of where energy is used in the business. Um, yeah, I can. I, yes, I just wanted. So here's a very simple example, and this is something I would use as an energy auditor or, or any energy auditor will use. You need to know uh, how many, how much energy has been used in, in a year. So you look at your annual data, for example, your kilowatts of energy, your liters of oil, your liters of LPG, if, uh, depending on what fuels you use, and you convert it all to kilowatt hour. And that's important that, that you're using one currency. And then you can use the total kilowatt hours, as we see here, the total kilowatt hours, and you divide that by, the, let's say, the area of your business, so the meter squared of your business, to establish a benchmark. So kilowatt hours per meter square per annum is a benchmark that would be used for the hospitality industry. And there is a national benchmark that was obtained uh, by the EPA, in, and, and that is 360 kilowatts per meter squared per annum. Of course, that's the average, and it does depend on the type of um, activity in your, say, a hotel. So but if you have a leisure center, it's going to be higher. But that's just, just something to aim at. James, can I come in on that one there? Uh, before you move on, uh, there's a lot in that slide for sure, and um, and I, I can imagine as a spreadsheet it would run across and do those calculations for you. Um, so the the benchmark is uh, in that example meter squared per annum, so an amount of energy you use per meter squared per annum, um, and that's a, that's an example of performance. How would a business know whether their performance is good or not so good? Yeah, can we just go back one slide there while we're discussing this? Um, the, slide, I suppose yeah. the the um, as I say, you know, this is a national benchmark. It's it's a figure that can be used. You can compare yourself to this. But I suppose the best benchmark really is your own benchmark, the benchmark you generate for your own business, because that is a, 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 a I suppose an air, a, a point that you start from. And if you want to improve your performance, you see how you improve by monitoring your energy against your an activity such as meter squared or maybe uh, sleeper nights or covers if it's a restaurant to see well, your improvement. Sure. So you have yeah. you have to have your own benchmark for your own business. That's the most important one, actually. So I'm taking from that, James, the first benchmark to establish is your own, what you currently, what your currently current energy usage is right now. That's right. Using, uh, you know, converting everything to, to one currency, as I say, kilowatt hours, and that in turn then can be used to work out your carbon. As you see there, the last column of this chart shows the carbon from each of those energies. And that's how you work out your, your scope one and scope two carbon emissions. And that's a very important point as well to look at yeah. because you need to reduce your carbon by 50 percent by 2030 you need to know what the tons of co2 equivalent are and there's a there's a kind of a standard conversion factor for that is there uh, there is yes i mean there, there are there are factors that convert electricity to tons of co2 depending on the co2 emissions from the grid the national grid okay so there is a bit of a calculation there, but I think one of the key points you're saying is we will be tasked and businesses will be tasked to reduce emissions by 50 percent. They'll have to demonstrate that they've reduced them. So your starting point is really important, getting that clear and tracking against that over time. Absolutely. 
you, you, on the earlier slide I was reading there, James, it was an interesting one, um, a, little, a little thing, turn them off, turn them down, turn them in as a kind of a, uh, something people can do. You can save energy just by turning things off and turning them down. Is that true, James? It sounds practical, it sounds really easy, but in your experience, do people really save, save money just through a turn it off campaign? Absolutely. Can we go back one slide, actually, because I, I skipped over that to go to this slide. Yeah, if I was you don't reading mind. it there and it was gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what, what I call these is the three T's. So you have turn them off, turn them down, turn them in. And that's that's a very basic way to manage energy. You can do it at home as well, believe me. So it's turning off lights that don't need to be on, turning off extraction fans that don't need to be left on. Uh, do a tour of your property at nighttime when everything is shut down and, and you will see a lot of equipment still left on. You can walk into a kitchen and see gas rings left on, grills left on when, when there's nothing actually happening in the kitchen. And this is just burning and wasting energy. So that's a very simple way to, to tackle energy management uh, at the cost you nothing. And I suppose what it might cost you is a bit of time to train up staff and make them more aware. Um, and and that's, that's why I use the three T's. The last one is um, turn them in. So when you're talking about inefficient equipment, such as boilers or um, dishwashers, that are inefficient, that are costing you money because they're actually um, not using energy efficiently, then it's time to turn them in. Great. Thank you. Very practical. Okay. Thanks very much, Tina. If we move on so to um, a couple of slides, I, I don't have access here to... And just move on one more, please. Yeah. Okay. So... This is here, you know, um, to answer your question, Tina, I didn't answer properly. Um, you can save a lot of money by a very simple turn them off, turn them down and turn them in. Um, training staff to turn off equipment can reduce your energy cost by as much as 10% has been proven. Um, this is an example of a kitchen porter um, using hot water. Which, and hot water is expensive because it's up to two to four times more expensive than cold water. And if the tap was left running for five minutes, for no good reason, in every hour of a 16 hour working day, uh, that would cost a business in the region of 6,000 euros per annum on hot water that, that was wasted. So, you know, turning off equipment and turning everything down can make a significant uh, reduction in your costs. Uh, we go to the next slide. So here's um, a, where we talk about turning it in, and this is actually a case study from the Revolution Bar in Waterford. And, um, they uh, had inefficient uh, dishwashers or glass washers, and they decided to buy two efficient winter halter glass washers at a cost of 2,600, probably a little bit expensive at the time for uh, glass washers, but in the long run, these dishwashers were reducing the cost of energy by 60%. It was also reducing the amount of water they needed and the amount of chemicals they needed. So it was actually paying for itself at over after two years, and after the two year payback, then they had a, a free dishwasher that was actually giving them a lot of efficiency. So certainly if you if you have old equipment, do a survey, make sure you're doing maintenance on a regular basis to check if equipment is efficient or inefficient. And if it does become inefficient, then it's time to move on and, and, and buy an efficient piece of equipment. Uh, for example, an oil boiler that might be old and inefficient might be only 70 or 60% efficient. So you're losing 40% of the energy in that case. Uh, the next slide. Okay, so we spoke about how to, to manage energy in terms of turning stuff off, turning it down. The other way to manage energy and manage energy costs is by shopping around, making sure that you're in contract with your supplier. Um, if you do go out of contract, you will see prices spike, particularly now at the moment. Uh, and I suppose now is not a great time to be shopping around and that is difficult to get a good contract uh, because of the way the fluctuations in energy price. There are other ways to reduce the cost of energy as well. As I said earlier, different energies, different prices. So moving, say, from oil to, to wood chip uh, is a, an efficient way of reducing your costs, particularly now at the moment because of the grants that are available for biomass, and um, you'll hear about that later on in the talk today. And also moving towards, like, say, renewable energy such as solar, that can be very uh, an efficient form of energy and a cheap form of electricity. If you go to the next slide, there's a case study from... Leahy's Farm, uh, they're a visitor centre, and they installed solar PV two years ago. They installed 62 kilowatts system. It's about a thousand euros per kilowatt to buy it, so that's about 62,000 euros of an investment. However, uh, that investment will be paid for itself in 
was predicted to pay for itself in four years, it's going to pay for itself in less than four years now because of the increase in electricity, because they're now getting electricity uh, at a fixed price based on 2020. Uh, it's green electricity and they're reducing their carbon. So there's a win-win all around with regard to um, uh, solar PV. And if you look at the quote there from um, Joan Lee, the business owner, he said, green electricity is supplied seamlessly on site and the system will pay for itself in just over four years, after which I will be guaranteed free electricity for another, another 26 years. So it's pretty, pretty uh, great technology. The next slide, please. Okay, so the, my final slide then, it's really just uh, to recap on, on my brief introduction to energy management. So collating information is so essential to have your data, to take out your bills, to interpret, it, interpret your bills so that you can see what you're using and you will know your carbon footprint from that. Um, you may need to use submeters to get information on where energy is used in your business. And once you identify the key energy users, then you need to manage those better. So by training your staff to turn them off, turn them down, or by installing uh, equipment such as thermostats and timers that control those equipments, that's very important too. And that is a, a very good way of managing energy as well. Preventative maintenance is important, as I said. Replacing old inefficient equipment is important. If you haven't uh, replaced every light in your property to LED, you should do so right away because there's huge opportunities there. And you should be looking at renewable energy for sure. And then the last part of the plan is actually coming up a with a way to reduce your carbon emissions to net zero by 2050. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, James. Uh, James, it's a, a handy 10-point plan there. I'm sure you know there's there's work behind every one of those points. But just a just a question, listening to those really strong examples you had there of you know cost savings and and carbon savings from particular initiatives. Uh, sometimes people think, and maybe I think, um, you know, people have, have done all the basic stuff now. They've kind of grabbed the low-hanging fruit and we're into higher spend territory. In your experience, is that true? Is there still a lot of low-hanging fruit or have people kind of moved on from that? Yeah, I suppose, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad to say that there, there's been a huge improvement in the hospitality industry over the last um, 10 years in terms of, um, you know, tackling the low-hanging fruit, like installing LEDs, for example. But yet there is a lot of unknown about, say, where is energy used? How much am I using? Um, one example, um, do I have a leak? Do I have a hot water leak? Uh, you won't know that unless you know how much energy you're actually using and you've benchmarked yourself. And we have found through our experience that a hot water leak on the ground can be very expensive, extremely expensive, and it can go undetected. Uh, that's one example. Another ex example is like I, I was in a hotel in Dublin two weeks ago and the whole corridor was covered in CFL bulbs. Um, and I worked out if they were to replace those with LED, they would save themselves 20,000 euros per year. So, you know, Just I know it was a large, a, well, sorry, it was a large, it was a, all the corridors in a very large hotel yeah. uh, uh, in, in the suburbs of Dublin. I won't say where. Um, but we hope to get them to change their lights uh, in the coming coming months. Um, other things, um, you know, I mean, just turning off, doing a survey of what's been left on, that can be a really easy way of actually targeting energy being wasted. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, that there's, uh, as you said, low cost and no cost areas that that can save uh, that can save a lot of money. I think sometimes uh, there's a, a mindset you hear it a lot in conversation that going green will cost you money you know, that uh, taking this option is going to mean money out of your business. And yet you've shown a lot of examples where it's actually the opposite. And it's a mindset thing about how you calculate them. You were saying there, you know, it will pay back within two years or three years um, after that. Do you think, is there a point at which going green really does start costing you money? Or is this, like you said, a win-win all around? I, I believe it's a win-win. Um, in the long run, it's going to save you money. Uh, we, we saw the example from Lee's farm where he expected a four-year return on investment. That now is a three-year or maybe two-year return on investment because of it, like, energy prices are increasing. Um, so, you know, I, I just, uh, and not to mention the fact that uh, being green has huge benefits to your business in terms of PR, your profile. Uh, visitors are now looking for, uh, you know, um, hotels and other hospitality businesses that are tackling the carbon. You've got to be able to say you're doing that. Um, so there's a lot of spin-off effects um, for being carbon neutral and being sustainable. 
And if you look at any multinational company in, in the world, it takes sustainability as a core value. So I think we need to do this as well uh, throughout the hospitality industry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, some businesses will obviously be further along their journey um, than others, James. Some have quite a lot done. And so their starting point now might be quite different to someone who's really at the at the beginning of the journey. Is there ever going to be such a thing as like an industry KPI as such that everybody should be measuring and reporting on the same thing? Because certainly measuring and monitoring seems to be a big theme here. So um, that requirement yeah, is likely look. to come into the industry. I, I, I believe there should be, uh, when, when I was involved in the Green Hospitality Programme in, in back when the EPA were funding it, we were developing KPIs for energy, water and waste. And I, I think it is up to the, the state uh, bodies to ensure that such um, um, KPIs are developed so that the industry can see where they, where they stand on, on these areas of energy, water and waste, for example. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's the direction in which we're headed. You mentioned the government's commitment to, you know, reduce by 50 percent by 2030, which is a tall order and that businesses will be um, expected to do the same. At the moment, that's not a statutory requirement, is it? Um, are we likely to see it become that? Yeah, my understanding is it is coming down the tracks uh, as part of the Climate Action Act by the government that they will be requiring the various business sectors to to reduce their carbon by a certain amount. They will be given um, given details as to what they need to achieve. That's yeah. my understanding. So, if you haven't already started, now's a now's a good time to to start. James, thanks very much for that. Um, really practical, lots of information. As Aileen said, you will get the slides uh, after this webinar, so you'll be able to look back on that. James, I know you'll be back to us later for Q&A, but uh, thank you very much for now. And we'll thank move you. on to um, our next speaker, who is Cormac McCarthy. And Cormac is a programme executive with the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. Um, and Cormac is going to share some important information on the range of supports available for businesses through SEAI, with a particular focus on the EXCEED programme, um, of which he is programme executive. And EXCEED stands for Excellence in Energy Efficient Design. So for more details on that and other programmes, I'll hand you over to Cormac now. Thanks very much, Tina. Yeah, so first of all, I'd just like to say um, on the role of SEAI, our goal is moving towards a low carbon energy future. So to do that, we need to use less energy and clean energy. And ideally, it should be environmentally sustainable, secure and affordable. And we also develop new solutions to meet our energy needs. So just to give you an example of some of the SEAI supports available, and I will be, I will touch on some of these, but I will have a focus on the XSEED program. But just to, to give you some information, which may be of use to you today, is our SEAI Energy Academy. You can sign up for free. Uh, check the link on the website. There's 24 modules, and it's a great starting point for just understanding about energy, climate change, decarbonization for business, um, how to understand your energy bills, solar PV, EVs, and so on. So it's a, it's a really good starting point for those of you who are just beginning your, your journey um, into energy. Also, we, we run some workshop-based training. So there's introduction to energy management, and you'll see some information on those on our SEAI event bright pages. The, the support scheme for energy audits, I think that's going to be very useful to a lot of the, the, the people on the call this morning. Um, we do offer small medium enterprises a voucher worth 2,000 euros to get an energy audit done with a registered energy auditor. There's a list of all the registered energy auditors on our website. And generally speaking, that uh, 2,000 euros voucher would cover the cost of a typical energy audit. Of course, that depends on, on the size of your, your asset. But that's definitely worth checking out, I think, for a lot of people on the call this morning. And it's open all year round for applications. Uh, the next scheme here is energy efficiency obligation scheme, which would be to do with um, converting your energy savings into energy credits. Another one which I think might be of use uh, to, to many many folks on the call here is the support scheme for renewable heat. Now, this is, this is very good when you're changing away your heat system, moving away from fossil fuels to something more renewable, such as you know, heat pumps or biomass boilers and so on. So there's further information available on the website. But I think if, if you are looking at just changing that one measure and moving away from fossil fuels, that could be a really useful program for you to check out. 
There's also support for electric vehicles for business. Um, there's a grant of up to 3,800 euros towards that. And also the, the community energy grant, which I think is, is going to be of, of use and of interest um, to people here this morning. Um, essentially, you can, you can go on the website, contact the project coordinators in your area for advice on those. But the, the, um, it ranges from small projects from 50,000 up to larger projects up to 1.5 million. So there's, there's good value to be had there. Um, and I would encourage you all to, to check out those, those support schemes. Sorry, Tina, I, I think you might be on mute. Sorry, Cormac, thanks. Before um, you move on to, to the next program, you've shared maybe six or seven different supports, um, training, grants, etc., which is great. It's fantastic to see that all accessible to the businesses. There's a bit of work, though, to get up to speed with each one and which one might be the right one for your business. What's your advice on that? How can a business get help or how, how can they navigate these supports just to, to land on the right one for themselves? Sure, that's a fair question. Well, the first thing I would do is I would recommend uh, signing up for the Energy Academy. So you'll get a lot of, you'll get a good overview there of what's available what and, and what sort of um, supports you can be looking at. And it will just broaden your, your, your baseline knowledge on energy. And I would also recommend looking at the support scheme for energy audits because the registered energy auditors, they, it's a really good starting point. It will give a baseline for how much energy is being used, what pieces of equipment are using the most energy, where savings can be made, and so on. And from that report, from that audit report, um, the auditors often make recommendations as to which schemes may be most suitable for that enterprise. So I think that those two are, are really good. Um, and then, as I mentioned as well, the um, the support scheme for renewable heat, if you're looking at a, a single measure, like moving away from, from your, your heat source, from fossil fuels to renewables, that's really good as well. So I would start with the Energy Academy and an energy audit if possible, yeah. Okay, so if you're if you're successful in getting the energy audit grant, is it, it's, I know you said it's, it's open to everybody, so it is possible to get that grant. What James was speaking about earlier, you know, finding out what your starting point is, establishing your basement, baseline, your kilowatt hours, you know, per sleeper per year. Will the auditor help with that? Is that the kind of thing that uh, that would come from that? Yes, they they will establish a baseline for you. So, and and in line with what James was talking about earlier on, it will help identify areas of of significant energy use, and from that you will be able to see where energy can be saved, and it will also help you understand if there might be wastages of energy, leakages and so on, or if, if, if certain um, types of energy can be converted in something else. For example, um, you know, a kitchen, the heat in the kitchen, that's energy. And, and where is that heat going? And could that be used for something more productive? You know, is it just evaporating off or, is it, or, or can it be used to heat something else within the, the facility? So those kind of things can be looked at. And, and absolutely, the, the energy auditors will give you um, a good overview of of your current situation. Yeah, that's brilliant. Sounds like a kind of a an objective set of outside eyes, and you end up with a roadmap of kind of priorities uh, where where to move to from there. Sounds super. I have one burning question in my head. If I've already spent money, if I've invested in some of these areas that are grant aided, and I'm getting the carbon savings and cost savings and whatever, can I apply for a grant or retrospectively? Unfortunately not. If, if work has already been done, we can't uh, retrospectively grant aid any of those opportunities. Um, but the programme I'd like to talk about next, the Exceed programme, which I'm working on, um, while we can't uh, retrospectively grant aid, uh, I think the, the process is very worthwhile in following because it can also identify other significant opportunities which may otherwise be missed through an energy audit. It takes that deeper dive and I'd like to, to maybe tell you a little great. bit more about that. Yeah, great. Thanks, Cormac. Okay, so uh, as Tina mentioned, EXCEED stands for Excellence in Energy Efficient Design. And it's essentially a certification program which helps businesses achieve optimum energy performance. The certification is based on the Irish standard IS399, Energy Efficient Design Management. 
and it applies a standardized approach to project design and implementation for a new facility, an extension or renovation of an existing building, um, an energy upgrade of a building. So it's very, it's ideal for these type of facilities because the, the best energy savings you, you can make is the energy that you don't actually need to use. And the ideal starting point is as early as possible. So at design stage, if you can implement energy efficient design there, you will make much more significant cost savings than trying to retrofit an already existing building. There's also a grant element to, or, to this program. So there's grant support of up to 1 million euros per project available, and it is open year round um, for applications by businesses and public sector organizations. So just to give you an idea um, of what types of expenditure we support, so there's two stages to the exceed process. The stage one is essentially carrying out studies. So it's similar to an energy audit, um, but it would take that deeper dive. Um, there's, there'd be a register of energy saving opportunities resulting from this and all energy, uh, significant energy users are challenged and analyzed as part of the process. So you can get support for this. So the, the first step would be to procure an EED expert who will carry out these feasibility studies and support can be given for that. There's also support for energy modeling or additional concept engineering design activities. And then stage two would be um, more capital support for equipment such as heat pumps, air handling units, more efficient machinery, insulation, Etc. There's also support for insulation commissioning costs and any additional professional services which may need to be carried out. And I would recommend you go on our, our website and look at the Exceed certification page and the grant page for further information. And just to, to give you an idea of the levels of support available, typically for stage one, the pre-investment costs, um, for a large organization, you can get up to 50%. That increased to 60% for a medium organization and 70% for a small organization. And that would include the energy efficient design expert professional fees, energy modeling, or any specialist consultancy fees that might need to be uh, included as well. Uh, stage two, capital costs. So we would support above the baseline costs, typically for equipment, installation, or additional professional fees. And you can possibly get up to 30% for a large organization, 40 for a medium organization, and up to 50% for a small organization. Now, I suppose you, you're asking yourself the question, why should I be interested? Well, we have 9 million euros in grant support available for 2022. There's, as I mentioned already, there's up to 1 million euros per, pro, uh, per project. And implementing the Exceed process can help businesses to future-proof their assets by designing for optimum energy performance, it will reduce your energy bills and CO2 emissions, improving competitiveness and boosting your reputation by demonstrating a commitment to sustainability. And what makes it different from an energy audit is that while an energy audit will uh, look at all the equipment within your asset and how to control that, the Exceed process takes a step back and looks at the energy service and why does that energy service need to be there in the first place? You know, and just taking lighting as an example, do we need lighting in this area? Is the area overlit, underlit? Is there a different way of, of, of approaching it? Uh, might we use a lighting dome and, and use natural lighting? And it works its way out from the energy service to the process and then the equipment. So it does take that deeper dive into your your facility and it takes a holistic approach so it doesn't look at any one measure in isolation it will look at all energy users and how they interact with each other so finally i just like to um move on to the oops a big pardon move on to the next slide just how to apply so the key documentation is on our website we're open for applications all year round and if you're coming in with a with a large project there there is no obligation to complete it by the end of this year you have until the 1st of October in 2023. So I would recommend have a look at our, our grant scheme guidelines. They're on the website. You'll see eligibility details and costs. You'll see more information about the evaluation process, the audit and inspections process, and of course, of course, the grant payments. There's an online application form and an instructions manual 
and feel free to contact us, get in touch with us. Um, there's a phone number there which you can contact our help desk and they will put you in touch with any of the schemes I've mentioned already. Or you can email xc.seai.ie and you can also submit an expression of interest on our website and just give us some, some basic information about your facility and we'll get back to you within a week. So I hope that's going to be of use to you all. Brilliant, Cormac. Thank you. The the slides have all the information which people will get afterwards. And of course, the SDAI website is very clear in all of that as well. Can I ask, uh, Cormac, how long is the process for application? I know of a business who's in the process right now and it's taking a bit longer than they expected. So if you're if this is of interest to you, what should you factor in time wise? OK, so typically for a stage one um, application, we would take uh, approximately three weeks to process that on our site and that would include you know financial checks there'd be um an ad admin review there'd be a technical review and then we'll go through the the management teams uh um for for final review so that can take up to three weeks um typically what we would also see is the stage one studies um applicants would give themselves two to three months to carry out those studies so that's that's a realistic time frame because it, it takes a, a bit of time and of course that depends on the complexity of the organization as well it is possible to do it in less time but it would would allow maybe two to three months for this stage one process stage two then depending on what opportunities are being selected for a stage two application can take a little bit longer there's more technical details involved there's more um time required for us to review it on our site. So that could take between six and eight weeks, depending on the size of the, the project. And of course, then the projects themselves can take, um, you know, they can they can run on for six, eight months, you know, even up to a year okay. in some cases. Okay, so really kind of four to six months is a good time frame to, to be allowing there. You mentioned a million euro as the maximum amount. Is there a minimum amount? Who's, you know, what percentage of hospitality businesses, I'm sure people are asking, would uh, would be eligible for this is there a minimum amount of spend involved here no there's not a minimum amount but um there is a minimum level of energy use so to qualify for um an exceed grant the asset would have to use more than a hundred thousand kilowatt hours per annum of energy and ideally a lot more than that uh, to get to the best benefit from it and the payback period then would have to be between two greater than two years and less than 20 years okay greater than two years and less than 20 years okay Cormac again you'll be back with us as well for uh, the questions later but thank you very much for all of that for now we'll talk to you again in a, in a little while we'll move on now we're staying on the question of uh, of money and in particular the question of uh, finance and that very topic I'm going to introduce Shane McCullough who is the product development manager at the Strategic Banking Corporation of Ireland SBCI and Shane Shane is going to share details of new finance opportunities particularly designed to support energy efficiency measures so Shane you're very welcome thank you very much Gina. thanks for the introduction uh, first of all, I might just give our listeners a quick introduction to who SPCI is for those that aren't familiar. Uh, many people will know ACC and ICC. SPCI, the Strategic Banking Corporation, is Ireland's state bank and the, the, the current iteration of, of those previous institutions. Our aim is to provide long-term, flexible, low-cost finance to Irish SMEs. And we do that in partnership with various government departments in including the Department of um, Climate, but also with European institutions such as the European Investment Bank and the um, European Investment Fund. SPCI also doesn't lend directly to SMEs, but we partner with lenders in the Irish market. So with that, I might just give a very quick introduction of, the, of our scheme that we feel is most relevant to our listeners today. So we will shortly have a scheme in the market called the SPCI Energy Efficiency Loan Scheme. And I suppose why, why we've got to producing this scheme is, as I say, we're focused on helping SMEs. And re a recent study across the EU shows that Irish SMEs invest at half the level of the European average in energy efficiency. So we really feel that there's a need for intervention here to help Irish SMEs make these kinds of investments. So I'll jump into a little bit more detail on what this scheme actually looks like. So the, the Energy Efficiency Loan Scheme is a 150 million loan scheme 
that's available to Irish SMEs. It includes loans of between 10,000 and 150,000, repayment terms of between one and 10 years, reduced interest rates, and it's likely to include kinds of products, term loans, higher purchase, asset finance. I run through those rather quickly, but I suppose what's really important in these features is that they've been crafted specifically to support investment in energy efficiency. Um, James and Cormac have alluded to LED lighting, the short paybacks, the low hanging fruit. Those, those kind of projects can be financed very easily because of the short payback. Some other projects or blended projects with, that bring in renewables, solar PV, tend to have longer paybacks. And that's why we've ensured that this scheme will have repayment terms of up to 10 years to make it suitable for those longer investments and to make sure that you're as much as possible that the savings can match the repayments so that your own business cash flow, uh, that this is cash flow neutral in terms of the impact on your own business. Equally, the interest rates um, are below market rates. We, this scheme will actually um, launch within the next fortnight will launch across five lenders um, on a phased basis uh, with all of those five being in the market by the end of August. But the reduced interest rate is a, is a key point in this. For instance, um, every 1% every reduction in the interest rate for, say, a solar PV installation will shorten the payback by six months. So we see this launching at 4% 4, 4 at, the, at the lowest end um, of what will be available under this scheme. And that probably compares to somewhere in the six to seven percent um, rate that would be currently available in the market. So you're looking at a one percent reduction in your payback just as a result of this lower interest rate. A point I would call out is, and I'll get into more detail on a second, is what kind of assets, what kind of investments can this support? In order for the loan to be, for the in investment to be eligible to avail of a loan under this scheme, the particular equipment or product needs to be on the SAI's triple E register. And that's a register publicly available on the SAI's website, easily searchable. And it's a register of energy efficient equipment. It's also the same register that the revenue commissioners use in terms of assets that qualify for accelerated capital allowance. So that allows you to write off the depreciation of that asset in the first year rather than over the lifetime of the product. So what, what kind of assets fit into this? I think um, a lot of what um, James and Cormac have already talked about, James took, gave the example of, I think the, the glass washers, absolutely, that's the kind of equipment that fits in here. And um, Cormac talked a lot about um, stage two of the XC program and the kind of um, equipment that's in there, the variable speed drives and cooling and heating refrigeration, all of that fits in here. And um, solar PV installation, electric vehicle charging points, charging infrastructure, I know, in, in, in a lot of hotels, that's something that's been looked at for um, to be included in car parks as well. In terms of how do you actually go and avail of a loan under this scheme, as I say, we expect it to be in the market within the next fortnight. The application process is a two-step process. While SPCI doesn't lend directly to borrowers, you do come to SPCI first just to check your eligibility. We typically turn that around within 24 hours and give you a code. That code says you're eligible to apply for a loan under the scheme. And then you approach one of the five participating lenders to go through the normal credit process with them. And you bring that code to them. I suppose just on a quick summary, what I really want to say is takeaways of this. This is ideal for the kind of equipment upgrades that the previous speakers have talked about. It'll be in the market in the next fortnight. And go to the SPCI website first to check your eligibility and then go ahead to any one of the five participating lenders there. And um, that's a whistle stop tour, so I will leave you at that point. Jane, yeah, really, really uh, practical and to the point. And again, the slides have all the relevant information. The takeaway there is uh, why, it, why it's of interest, favorable interest rates. Uh, potentially longer payback time and eager to support energy efficiency projects at the moment. Thank you very much, Shane. You're staying with us for the Q&A and I think James and uh, Cormac are coming back to us now as well. Um, again, to everybody who's uh, listening in, if you have questions, now's your time to drop them in and, and we'll see them there. Before we get on to uh, some of those, I suppose it's questions straight for Shane and Cormac. Um, 
we hear this often in hospitality, there can be a sentiment that hospitality or tourism may not be eligible for some of these supports. And we have a couple of questions there. How many really will qualify here? Is this really open to tourism and hospitality? Um, and it's to Shane and Cormac in particular about the supports you're speaking there. Uh, is there, I suppose, insight you can give on that for us? Yeah, I'm happy, happy to take that first. And um, absolutely, this is open and available to hospitality. I suppose the caveat um, I would add is that you still have to go through the bank standard um, credit application process and still the normal credit assessment in terms of um, uh, repayment capacity um, on, on the loan and on the value of the loan. But I would say that this scheme has been crafted in such a way that I mentioned being cash flow neutral on the business so that the savings that these kind of equipment investments should generate for the business should be in or around with that longer repayment term available in or around the repayment level so there should not be a burden on the business on beating the loan repayments that should make it an easier on the right for the bank for the lender yeah thanks shane and cormac yeah and no i would definitely um say it's suitable for hospitality industry and at the moment uh, we have quite a large number of hotels actually going through the the exceed process and we've had a, a few who've already come through it but we definitely are seeing an increase in the numbers um for those organizations which are willing to to take that deeper dive into their energy use and um, we're seeing some quite creative solutions as well coming out of the the, the processes uh, i won't mention any names now but you know one example springs to mind of a hotel that had a stream at the bottom of its property and they decided to put in a hydroelectric system there to, to make use of that asset and to reduce their energy costs and to to you know to power a significant part of the hotel so you know and that that has come out of the exceed process and i think you know we're definitely seeing an increase in the numbers so i would i would recommend to investigate it further yeah great cormac um Somebody has put in the chat there that a deep dive can cost up to about 40,000. Would that be true? And can those kind of savings be recuperated or those kind of expense, can that be, be, be recovered in savings? Well, it does depend on, you know, who is actually carrying out the work because different um, consultancies will charge different amounts per day and so on. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, like, up, you know, 50% for a large uh, a large enterprise, 50% of those initial stage one costs can be grant supported, and that does increase then for medium and for smaller enterprises as well. So some of those costs can certainly be recouped, but even just going through that process and investing some money um, to get those studies done is often worth it because it does identify significant opportunities further down the line, which will provide energy savings. Great, thanks Cormac. Um, the question for you, James, and it's quite a specific one, it's about um, CHP, so combined heat and power solutions for energy efficiency. Um, so the question is really, have you advice on that? You might explain first what it is and any advice you might have in that area. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I'm not an expert on CHP, but, um, uh, and CHP basically is where you generate electricity on site using gas or biomass to generate um, electricity and also to generate heat because when you generate electricity you also have heat which is up to 60 percent of the energy that you actually burn goes into heat so you really need to have a, a way of dealing with that excess heat that you uh, generate from the system um, otherwise it's, it's not attractive um, I've, I've, to be honest with you, I've just heard mixed mixed reactions on, on CHP. Um, some good, some bad. I've known some hotels which have turned it off because it just wasn't um, cost effective. Um, so, I, I, as I say, I'm not an expert, but uh, I, I can't say more than that, really. Thank you. Unless okay. one of the guys, maybe Cormac, might know a bit more about it than me. <clears throat> um, no, I probably don't, actually, James. But... Uh, I would say that there, there can be different levels of efficiency around them. Um, you know, if the, the CHP is is oversized, then, then that's inefficient from an energy perspective. There may also be other uh, ways to, to provide the, the heat and energy to your site without using CHP. So I would investigate all opportunities around that really before committing to any one of them. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, it, you mentioned there, Cormac, you know, kind of uh, businesses taking innovative approaches and harnessing a river and stuff like that. One thing um, I know from speaking to businesses that have been involved in this is that the technology is improving all the time. And if you looked into something three or four years ago, it may not have been viable, it may be now, or equally that the payback time is shortening because of new technologies coming on all the time, even after investment. Um, is that the case? Are we seeing that on a kind of a widespread level or can we expect more of that? Yeah, I think that is the case. The technology is improving all the time. P equipment is getting more efficient. And I think payback periods are reducing as a result of the up increased uptake in renewables. So I think that's a that's a fair point to make. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's uh, it's worth revisiting, even if you've looked into things um, in relatively recent years. There's a question there about can we claim for recent works retrospectively, somebody who insulated the building a couple of months ago. I think, Cormac, you were clear enough on that on the SCI front. Um, you, no, not retrospectively. It must be after the funding has been approved. Um, now, this is a, a question from Fault Ireland, and I know between us we probably have some knowledge in that, that in January at, um, I think it was... a. Uh, not sure what the event was, Vulture Ireland did announce that it was going to have a carbon calculator for the industry uh, sometime this year. And uh, is there updates on that? I know since that time we do have the Department of Enterprise Trade and Employment carbon calculator. Um, James, did you know something about that one? People are using that at the moment to, to calculate carbon footprint. Yeah, I, I've, I've actually put it into my slide, the link to that particular um climate calculator which is very good actually um, because it allows you to work out your your scope one scope two emissions and it also generates an action plan where you shows you how you can actually tackle carbon in your in your business so um, and that's that's on my slot one of my slides actually that that link I believe uh, for Ireland intend to um, use that uh, and maybe to develop that particular tool uh, to be more focused on hospitality that's that's my understanding <clears throat> That's right, because in your in your presentation you were speaking about you know working out your carbon footprint and you'll get that once you've established your kilowatt hours. Um, Fulcher Ireland are certainly launching. I think the update is that it will be in the autumn. Uh, they will be working with the Department of Enterprise Trade and Employment calculator, which of course makes absolute sense. Um, we'll be adapting it to hospitality. We'll also be using the climate toolkit for business that is available through the Department of Enterprise Trade and Employment now as well. I think it's important to say you did show benchmarks there, James, of you know the most recent one being 2020. That's not necessarily that's not necessarily the performance that gets us to reduce 50 percent emissions. That's like the average performance of the industry right now. Isn't that correct? It's important to say that. So it's something to compare yourself with. It's not necessarily the target. Um, and the more that we have people using the carbon calculator, we'll start to establish um, more benchmarks for the industry as well. Um, OK, a question, I suppose, and for anybody who'd like to take it. Um, What's the risk of a business doing nothing right now and saying, look, we've been talking about this for a few years now, guys. It's been it's been a topic for a while. I know energy costs have really soared since then. But in general, if somebody's saying, oh, I'll leave that till next year or whatever, what would you what would you say to that? Well, I think, I mean, as I, as I alluded to earlier, um, there's a lot that can be saved by no cost, low cost measures. And it's easy pickings and really people, what people need to do is establish a, an action plan, if you like, a, a kind of, you know, a list of things they're going to do and to uh, nominate those actions to staff in-house. Um, you know, something that we talk about a lot is um, a management system to deal with this. It doesn't have to be complicated, but it needs to be integrated as part of everyday management. So the management are talking about energy at their at their boardrooms uh, and, and how we're going to manage that and as I suppose setting aside people in the establishment to actually do that because if you don't give yeah. time to staff to, to actually tackle energy management it's not going to happen and that's a yeah. really important and it really does pay off to to invest time and staff to do this. Yeah, it, it all comes back to the numbers with this one, doesn't it? To the measuring, the monitoring and making uh, database decisions. One final question really is um, solar panels on an island. Is there is there an issue with salt buildup on solar panels? Real practical question there. You heard of that, uh, James, somebody thinking about investing yeah, in solar panels yeah, I, I in a coastal heard area. That. Um, you know, there can be damage to solar panels near near the coast. 
Um, and I've also heard the answer to that is to invest in solar panels that are more durable. So there are lots of different types of solar panels out there, of different quality. Um, and yes, unfortunately, yes. that that's a, that's a difficulty for for the ordinary guy to know what, is that a good one or not. But do check out the specs and make sure that there is a guarantee on the on the panels. Okay, thanks. And a final final question. Um, I'll send it to you, Cormac. Any advice for energy contract negotiations right now, given the volatility um, of everything? If you're if you're going into negotiations now. Are you talking about negotiations with your, your energy service provider or if you're negotiating to get some um, energy studies done, like an energy audit? I would think it's with your energy supplier. Okay, well, um, I'm not sure I'm qualified to, to speak mm -hmm. on their behalf, but uh, you know, there's no harm in asking, is there? Yeah, that's it. No, there's no no particular advice. It's extremely volatile, uh, as we know. Look, I'm mindful of the time. On that note, I'm going to say thanks to everybody who sent in questions there and for participating. Thanks to James Cormack and Shane as well. And I'll hand back to Aileen now as well. Thank you. That's great. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I just want to take the opportunity to say um, we had huge numbers on here today and everyone stayed really engaged. If you wouldn't mind taking a moment to give us your feedback on the poll on the screen, this will really help us to monitor how we're doing. That should pop up there in a minute. Um, a huge big thank you to our panel, Joe to Tina, James, Cormac and Shane um, for their expertise and such practical advice and guidance. Um, I think it's really coming at a time when people are really looking for that. And also then to my whole team back of house here who have helped me pull this whole thing together and to bring you this webinar today. We will have more. There will be more happening in September. September. I know the calculator was mentioned today, but I won't go into that now. Um, but we will be launching these whole full suite of um, real practical um, and tactical supports um, as part of a full suite of climate action supports. And we will definitely delve deeper into the topics affecting you then. So we hope you can join us and um, always keep an eye on our national schedule of supports where you will see these on our business supports hub. Um, I think it's up there on screen now. Um, and that is where you can register for any upcoming um, supports. So on that note, I'm going to say we're right up to the hour. Um, thanks and see you next time.